Hello and welcome to the Indie Alternative Podcast with me, Chris. I hope everyone is doing well. It's been a long time since I've released an episode, so this is quite exciting. But today I've got a really interesting guest. I'm joined by Will Potter. And Will Potter is an artist, author, illustrator, and he's responsible for bringing to life Giza, the long lost Britpop band from the 90s. We have a fascinating conversation about how the concept of this um, project came to light, Will's time in the band Cud, and uh, his experiences uh, from that band obviously bleeding into the creative process of, of Giza. It's a Kickstarter project, and um, I'll be sharing all those links to what you can do to support that in the description or show notes to this podcast episode. So please go and support that as best you can. I am also incredibly lucky to speak to Martin Bland himself from the band Giza, who joins me at the end of the podcast to talk about what he thinks about the project. Um, It's a fascinating conversation with Martin and Will, and I hope that you enjoy it. I'll be back at the end of the interview to talk about all the ways that you can support the podcast and the Kickstarter for Giza. But without further ado, here's Will and Martin. Enjoy. Welcome to the podcast, Will Potter. How are you? I'm good. I'm I'm good um, under the circumstances. Cud have just come back from a tour and we're all really relieved that uh, we made it out in one piece and managed to play every single gig. I mean, that, that that is the thing at the moment with regards to just getting people to talk to me on this podcast at the moment. It's been horrendous because quite rightfully, everyone is back doing what they should be doing on stage or in the studio. So everyone's too busy to do other things or other, you know, sideline uh, things that, w- that help, you know, indie podcasters like me get by. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm aware of that, that um, the, the, the podcasters benefited from this uh, last year. <laughs> Uh, I, I know people who've been writing books, uh, you know, about sci-fi stars and they managed to get everybody just talking for hours because they were stuck at home bored. Yeah. Nothing else to do apart from, you know, just uh, massage somebody else's ego for a change. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, just get us to talk about ourselves. We'll be perfectly happy. Will, you've come on today to talk about sort of a latest project that you've got going at the moment but with with Giza. Many listeners will probably be aware of you or follow the sort of the Britpop uh, Instagram, Facebook and Twitter accounts might have seen or heard the, the rumblings of Giza and what's going on there socially. Um, but what was talk a little bit about this project and the, and the background behind it, because it's is really interesting. Yeah, well, it was instigated by Shelley Bond, who is um, an established editor of uh, DC Comics, Vertigo titles and set up her own imprint uh, a few years ago called Black Crown and got me and Philip working together on um, a cud story, Rich and Strange, um, which was great fun to do. I, I, it was like the story of cud, but misremembered by me and the singer who we were in an old folks home. <laughs> and we were, you know, we were getting on and the singer was convinced that um, we were still together, but he was backstage. And I was convinced that we were locked away in this old folks home uh, as part of some conspiracy by the singer. And I turned out to be right. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> he'd locked us away so he could get younger people to replace us. And it was it was a joke on all the kind of heritage circuit. And we were, um, you know, bands reforming. And, you know, maybe we were a bit past it and we were carrying on. Um, we had a lot of fun. Uh, but Shelley um, was a huge fan of Britpop. And then, um, Asked, asked me to pitch an idea um, set in the era. So I came up with this idea of Giza um, being a band that um, existed in the real world of Britpop with the real um, stars, Blur, Oasis, Suede, Pulp, all of these people would be background characters and possibly have cameos. Um, but Giza were also around, just out of view, didn't have quite the success uh, but were there at all the major moments. Uh, and, and also is also influenced by my experiences in CUD, because um, CUD was still going when Britpop was taking off. We, we, we finished in about 95. So we'd see these people on the scene. We'd go to some of the same parties, but were never branded in the same way, um, rightly or wrongly. <laughs> um, but we, we shared a lot of the experiences. 
And so how do you creatively approach something like this where, um, you know, you've got so many, I mean, I, I say putting a comic together or putting a story together is a, a graphic novel. It, it, this, the processes are the same. You have a timeline and you have ideas of where you want to go. Did you approach it the same way as writing a novel? Uh, it's slightly different with this one. Normally I would have um, a plot um, and, you know, work out a way to get there. But this one I worked with a timeline. Um, so I, look, I read um, a lot of books and biographies of the bands of the time, um, worked out which, which the key moments were, which I thought would be really good to drop the, my band and particularly the singer Martin into the scene. So, you know, I created this really detailed timeline from like the early 90s right down to about 1997 and worked out like, OK, I need the band to be demoing here. I need them to be signed here. It'd be a good time to have a first single here. I want them on the word at this time. Um, so, yeah, I even had to do ridiculous stuff like what's the word on the air at this, this, in this particular month? Who was presenting it? Um, I was watching videos of um, the uh, Brit Awards, of um, the Brat Awards, uh, looking at photos of um, Tony Blair's Cool Britannia party and working out who was there, who he could bump into, how he gate crashed a lot of these events. Um, and then I got it from A to B and then I created relationships within the band. Um, and ultimately I had to work out where he is now, um, which I, I won't reveal um, because that is the kind of tail end of the story. It's part of the mystery that goes on. Yeah. Um, it's plotted as, as five stories that take place in different eras, so maybe a year apart. Yeah. Um, in which the um, the band go through um, the generations from like an early suede uh, incarnation to you know they, they start to wear the Fred Perry's and and uh, suit up a bit and go a bit more blur, and then they you know they try to roughen up their image and go a bit more Oasis. By yeah. The end. Um. Yeah. So did you did you find it quite easy to round the characters then because of your own experiences, you know, bumping into musicians in that era? And did you have any ideas of kind of, um, I don't know, personalities that you wanted to be in the band? Uh, certainly. I mean, it was easier to um, come up with the circumstances. Um, it's, lots of things are familiar with with all bands uh, about that, that first um, US tour and, um, you know, getting the record company mi remixing your songs without you even knowing it. And then saying, Hey, I really like the new single with the sax solos. Really great. And so, <laughs> what sax solo? And where's my bass? It's, my bass is not on this version. All these kind of things that happen to us and happen to other bands. Um, in terms of the personality of the band, it was, it was key to get the, the, the singer, the, the main character, right. Um, so I took a bit of the character and circumstances of, you know, existing um, Britpop stars and thought, you know, he's, he's going to be a bit kind of laddish, he's a bit cocky, um, but also, you know, he, he, he you know, he, he maybe likes both boys and girls or pretends to, um, all, this kind of, all those kind of things. And then I had to create another person who was a bit straighter in the band. Um, who was naturally cool, didn't have to pretend to be cool, and that's the drummer, and she becomes like the muse in the band. Then I've got the bass player, which is, um, maybe that's more based on me, who's just <laughs> like, just straight, just there, does a job, and uh, most, most people ignore him. Um, most, the most relatable person that I can. Exactly, think I yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the guitarist um, Francis in the band, he's he's the naturally talented one yeah so he yeah. writes these great licks he's been a childhood um you know music student so he'd be like more bernard butler kind of like that he's he's better than 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 the others in musically and deserves to go really far and eventually you know he he will go on to greater things how so much I take a little bit, take a little bit from 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 existing people and a bit about my own experience and the people I've met in the music industry. How much do you uh, hear the music in your head of Giza when you're putting this stuff together, or, or or did you not get that far yet, or 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 is that something you've left open in your mind to interpret sort of 
Loosely. No, I, actually, it's 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 odd because I part of the the writing is, has has been writing lyrics for for geezer songs, so there are some completed geezer lyrics, um, um, because I have them performing songs at certain times, so I have to have the singer singing words. But yeah, it, it's there. I start writing words, and then the tunes there as I'm writing the lyrics, um, so I can yeah I can imagine the rhythm, um, and I can imagine people like Liam Gallagher singing this song or how this one would work with a kind of suede backing. Uh, so yeah, it's really weird to do that. And it was, it, it, re- it was really nice of the, um, the guitarist in, in Cud Mike has written a tune um, for the video, which we we're launching the Kickstarter campaign with um, in a, in a Britpop style. It, and strangely is the tune is written has almost like it's got a vocal melody over the top with no words. So I can imagine easily turning that into a real geezer tune. Um, but we just need to get Martin to sing it. <laughs> <laughs> that is, of course, the, the great thing about this campaign initially was that some people genuinely thought the geezer are a real band and were. And we had some people, um, there was particularly a guy called Matt who were playing the game perfectly and say, yeah, I remember Giza. Yeah, in the 90s, I saw them supporting, was it the auteurs at uh, Dublin Castle? And, um, and then he, he pretends he heard them on Spotify. So we have these other people saying, like, I can't find them on Spotify. Where <laughs> are they? And so then I have Martin saying, yeah, bloody Spotify, you know, you know I've been trying to get in there for ages. <laughs> At is, some point, we are going to have to drop a, a geezer song. Uh, yeah, it's inevitable, really. Well, it's it's kind of it's um, uh, the gorillas, but it, but with in two D, I'm guessing, or more two D. But yeah, you... I've, I've joked with Martin, obviously. Um, oh, sorry, I've joked with Philip um, as an old friend of uh, Jamie Hewlett, and it, we, we're all deadline comic people, so we used to hang out together quite a lot in Worthing in the nineties. Um, I've described. Um, the geezer is like pound shop um <laughs> the pound shop gorillas because i because i did this really basic animation for the video it's <laughs> I, I can't imagine imagine it ever being the same and uh, it's not a competition with a, a, a jamie and damon at all it's just a, a until i put them in an animation i never even thought about it being like gorillas at all what what are your memories of the era obviously you you were a musician at that time as well and you were mixing with these people are still on a pedestal and, and and fascinated by these characters all these years later and certainly that shaped me and my musical influences when I was young and what I wore and where I went and everything but it it was it was an odd time in in retrospect we were all really lucky uh because we there was still money going around the record business then um and it wasn't all social media and mobile phones and it was like you, you got big money uh, deals from record companies okay that meant that you owed them money and they got a lot of power but you know there were parties there were um there was big support for tours so it's fun you could show off and you'd meet people backstage and 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 the, the music papers were either behind you or or slagging you off and very important as a result uh, and and yeah even if we kind of loathed them we also loved them and uh, you know, competed with other bands about who's going to get the single of the week, who's going to get the cover. And that excitement's kind of gone now um, when it's all, uh, um, you know, it's, there's loads and loads of different websites to try to promote yourself. And it, it doesn't feel key to to have like the enemy or Melody Maker backing you. Uh, so it, is, it was a heyday in terms of music. But it, specifically about Britpop, it was weird for Cud that... Um, uh, we we kind of collided with that scene. Um, there was I, I don't know. It's, it's, there's a very famous issue of Select, which had like um, Brett Anderson on the cover, uh, and Stuart McConey was partly responsible for it. This whole idea of a, a British wave that was going to stop um, grunge, and it it, it kind of led to Britpop in a way. But he called it Lion Pop, and it, <laughs> inside there was like it was suede. Denim, Saint Etienne, the Auteurs, and Cud were all these kind of slightly arty bands that weren't grungy and were going to like push back like Dad's Army and keep grunge at bay. 
Uh, Lion Pop as a name didn't really take off, um, but within a year it was Britpop, mm. and it was Suede, and it was maybe Denim and Auteurs. There was no Cud anymore. We weren't part of that. It was, uh, I, I guess, a lot to do with um, you know modern life is is you know, rubbish and uh, and um, the, the look of look of Blur, all that kind of um 60s pop influences and mm. we didn't really lend ourselves to that look and we also had a really rubbish name <laughs> so uh so we were a little bit put out by that that suddenly there were loads of bands being um noticed and we weren't part of it and uh where we struggled to get into the top 30 and struggled to get any TV at all. Suddenly, Top of the Pops were inviting on indie guitar bands, left, right, and centre. Mm. And I thought, God, if we'd only been around like a year later, yeah. you know, we yeah. might have we might have had these opportunities. Um, but uh, you know, that's just sour grapes. <laughs> yeah, but it, <laughs> a, is it... a little bit of that rubs off in this comic in Giza, in the like a little bit of kind of. Uh, I guess jealousy, um, and you know, it's just like you know, here's a band that didn't quite make it in Britpop. Uh, they were like also rounds, and you could say the same about Cud to, to an extent. We had our success. We were a part of an earlier scene, um, and uh, you know, we we didn't break it big like the Britpop bands. Um, but now I can look back and find it funny and How- self, quite a self de- deprecating band. Well, that, that that seems to be a, a quite a common theme throughout the, the people that we've, well, the people that I've spoken to on this on this podcast series is that um, those lesser known bands or ones that didn't poten- potentially you know trouble the top forty as often as as the sort of the main five or six look back at it fondly have moved on, and you, you know found other outlet, outlets for their creativity, which is a good like leading to my question to you is really you know how did you then make that transition or was it easy to make that transition to what you're doing now in your sort of day job and writing and illustrating and things um it's it's strange actually i've always been into comics and writing and drawing um and i was in the early days of card and it actually put me in conflict with the band when i i chose to go to a comic convention instead of playing a gig (laughs) Uh, but then we in a way we benefited um in the early 90s that uh I, I benefited in that I got into Deadline comic um, because I was a member of CUD and people like Jamie and Philip were CUD fans. And so I met the editors and they liked CUD. And so I, and they also liked my comics. Um, and then CUD got featured by Deadline and became a, a cool band for comic people to like with graffiti and the comic strips of, of our logo and things. Okay. Um, so I kept those connections. So when um, I left CUD in 95, I came down to London and uh, started to reach out to publishers and and I ended up doing more writing and editing um, of strange things like Cindy comic and uh, <laughs> some Disney titles and um, Sonic the comic. Uh, and I've been editing ever since um, and just occasionally writing. Uh, and I've almost come out of like comic retirement to do uh, for the last few years to do this um, cut strip and uh, geezer. It's certainly something I really enjoy. Um, and of course, at the same time, uh, about 10 years ago, Cud came out of retirement and I was happy to join in that as well. So balancing both has been great. And, yeah. <laughs> What's it been like reconnecting with the fans with Cud and, and touring and things? Th- that's great. And uh, like contrary, uh, in contrast to what I was saying earlier about like the nineties where there was all the music paper and there was like, you know, it could be petty jealousies with other bands. Now it's completely different. Now all the bands are just really nice to each other. And you say like, did I really think that Miles Hunt was a big head? He's really nice. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I guess because we, we don't have that competition anymore. We're all playing these kind of essentially heritage rock gigs or anniversary shows. And it's really nice when we bump into each other again and we we support each other and um we you know most of most of the bands have got like babysitters to rush back for and sensible prob you know normal problems in life yeah um and yeah, there's a lot more respect and friendship 
And in terms of the fans, it's the same. They, they, they're really up for it. They do complain about knee problems and, uh, <laughs> <you know, laughs> with all the bouncing up and down. But uh, yeah, it's, it is like a, going back to one big family. Are you, do you think you guys will ever do any uh, new stuff, recording or writing? Is that oh, been we have been. Oh, Where okay. have you been? Where have you been? Sorry. <laughs> no, we, 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 we've, we've not been that prolific, to be honest, in the last 10 years. Well, while the bands have put an LP, we, keep, we have an LP's worth of material, um, which we've been releasing in dribs and drabs as singles. Um, but we've never kind of finished off the album. We've never, there's a few songs that um, require a bit of polishing. Um, and uh yeah we could say no we'll just do some more we'll do some more and then we'll get the album out um i I do make fun of it the idea that you know that we'll finally release the album when we split up or something like that (laughs) we've 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 done these things where we've done anniversary shows for albums that you can't buy uh and you couldn't even stream them on spotify so it's like we're promoting something that is impossible to to benefit from yeah yeah (laughs) Um, but yes, we, we released we released a single this year um, during lockdown, it, and it's gone down well. And yeah, obviously it didn't chart, but uh, <laughs> we, we we sold enough. Um, yeah, we played it live, and it fits with the rest of our set quite easily. I I, I will say that um, the new recordings we've done um, over the last few years have, have been great, and like in a way, classic cud. Because one of the things at the end of uh, our tenure with a and Records was that they put a lot of pressure on us to uh, sound in the way in a way that they thought they could market internationally. So yeah. they'd reject loads of demos and we were doing quite compromising songs that thankfully they weren't released. Um, but now we're doing it purely for ourselves and the fans. And we, we like we like it now. This is what we should sound like. Um, you know, had we had a lot of power in 95, these are the records we would have made in 95, 96. So with with, with Giza, where, where, you've, you've mentioned you've started the, the, the Kickstarter by the time this, this podcast is released mm-hmm. or this episode, the, the Kickstarter will already be well underway. So just to remind people about or, or let people know what they can do and how they can support that. Well, most people know what Kickstarter is. It's crowdfunding um, where, you know, and it, unless we, we need a certain number of uh, people to back it at certain levels to hit a target. Uh, and when we hit that target, then we press go and we'll finish the, the comic and print it and send it out to everybody. Um, as well as doing this comic, which we're, we're doing as a seven inch single format uh, square, because it just seems perfectly right. Here's a, I'm holding up something on a podcast. You can't see this is a mini version of, of what we're doing. Um, which I did as a kind of promotional tool. We'll we'll do that. We're doing posters, lyric sheets, badges, T-shirts, just like a real band would have on the merchandise store, um, and and treating in that way. Like you know, you can get on the guest list and be first to get uh, the the you know the all access pass lanyard and some original art and things like that. We're doing this one-off issue, and if it succeeds there are another four stories already written and hopefully, you know, there'll be enough enthusiasm for us to continue the story because there are many events in the history of Britpop that I have thrown Martin into. And, uh, and I, I really can't wait to see Philip draw them because um, what he's done so far has been amazing. Um, you know, I'm a big fan of his work uh, and I think he's the perfect artist to, 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 to put a band into this world. It's very good at putting you in the action and very good from what panels that you've been able to share so far. The the style and everything is just just completely, for me, encapsulates, encapsulates the era. Uh, it's great. It's really good. And I, I really look forward to seeing it. Well, I, I hope you guess it's all right. I have, I have been going in pubs like the, the Good Mixer and taking photographs and send them <laughs> to him. So, yeah, actually, it hasn't changed very much since I was there. The, the seat covers are new, but... Yeah, but even as far as like the posters and the gig, uh, like uh, the, the ticket stubs and things like that, so look really authentic. And, and well, they uh, should because I, 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 another thing typical to bass players is that they're usually the archivists. So I have <laughs> a, above me here, I have um, all the cuttings from Enemy Melody Maker for Cud. Um, so I can take that era 
and like get Philip to you know drop in Giza as a support to uh, census things or something like that yeah. um, at a particular time. Get the prices right, the style right. I've also been um, mocking up enemy live reviews and Melody Maker gossip column features about Giza. Uh, in the same font and style to make it look like a genuine artifact from the period that's been great fun to to put my head in 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 the zone as a as a really mean live reviewer yeah 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 <laughs> like it's, again it's a kind of revenge it's a, <laughs> yeah. now i can understand why they wrote such bad things about cud it's because it's fun <laughs> yeah. shall, shall we hear from martin is it is it worth getting him in just to have a quick chat yeah, we we can see if he's uh, willing to chat. You know, he's a uh, he, slight. You know, he's he's quite cocksure. But, is he off uh, the toilet? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll go and drag him in. All right. All right. How's it going? You all right? I'm all right. You're talking about this uh, new comet, aren't you? Right, geezer. Yeah, and, and I want I'm... to have a word about that. You know, they they got me involved like in the early days. They were talking, they want to do this like graphic novel, they call it, and yeah. uh, all about my band and me. Uh, and they seemed quite genuine, you know, uh, they were going to tell the story, all, you know, guts and all. But I'm a little fear now that uh, they're going to just take the piss a bit. You know, I, the stuff I've been reading and the things they've been saying and the pictures they've been sharing, I think that, you know, I might look good in the pictures, but I'm worried they're going to. You know, make me out to be a bit of a loser, a bit of a fool. It won't really like that. I think you might be getting the wrong end of the stick, uh, Martin, because I think there's a lot of love and appreciation for you guys still, and the band. I'm getting, I'm getting a bit of that. It's nice. It's nice. I, I joined this like Twitter. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I'm getting some good feedback there. Uh, a lot of people, you know, didn't have Twitter back in the '90s, obviously. Um, but yeah, there's a few old fans coming on and a few old bands you know there's a lot of people like menswear and uh uh Rick, ricky from uh, shed seven been quite nice yeah uh, i'll say that but uh, the, that we he did he did slag us off a bit in the uh promo stuff for this geezer but we did the the kind of rivalry back then was was quite fierce wasn't it i mean do, do you did you ever get any scrape into any scrapes with any sort of well-known yeah, there's a, well there's a, there's a few incidences you know uh you know we, we've all got egos uh, and some of them have got big egos and uh some of them have got tired trousers but um yeah you know i, I did the, the the worst thing is when like i got you know a bit of an injury with a run-in with one of the gallagher's and it was the day before bleeding uh video shoot so i have to turn up with the, vi- the video with this like big scab on my nose no but well, they were uh, they were rough and ready weren't they but you just got to give as good as you get with the gallagher's that's right that's uh maybe uh you know can, something or in a comic i can uh, like uh, say something shit about them or something i don't know <laughs> <laughs> but well, maybe, we were... maybe they'll sue me i don't know okay who cares i mean looking back at your time and that, that era, do you remember much? Or was it, is it all a bit of a haze due to sort of those performance enhancements that you maybe took part in? Well, it, it's what they, they say, you know, it's like, yeah, if you can't remember it, uh, to make up something really cool. Uh, and, and that's what the, I think this, uh, this Geezer comic is going to be all about. You know, it's going to be about the legend, the legend that was Geezer. Cut out all the boring bits, all the hanging around, all the travelling up and down the M1. Uh, in, in a shitty van trying to get to gigs turning up late um, gear not working there were some there were some good times you know yeah. we, we, we should have been bigger than we were and you know hopefully this will remind people of how good geezer were now we should be an household name now are you still in touch with Francis Benson and Jess is there still love there or have you kind of just you know stopped talking to each well, other well Francis you know he, he was a talented geezer uh we we did we we did split up for a while and he went he went off to work with this uh, girl band you know a bit like the Spice Girls uh, they, were, they were called Swank yeah he wrote some cheap money he made a load of money with them to be honest um, but we did make up and we we started working together uh, on and off but now he's you know he's 
is is in demand as some like um, top notch producer now, and yeah. I, I dare say he hardly ever picks up his guitar. Well, I mean, Benson uh, seems to be the backbone. Was he? Was he? I mean, is he still like that now? I mean, is he still as rigid? I don't know what happened to Benson. Last I, last I heard, he was uh, he got one of those jobs as a delivery driver. <laughs> <laughs> I think he, uh, it was more money in uh, in uh, dropping off parcels uh, than uh, than bass playing, yeah, especially when you're not as talented as him. But, and, but uh, Jess Jess seems to be the one you have the most sort of camaraderie with. Is, uh, are yeah, you still Jess, friends? Jess Jess was special in a band. You know, I, I first saw her when uh, uh, she was playing drums in a band called The Pits. Oh, oh, yeah, oh I don't know when that be like. Uh, 1990 something like that and uh, when she moved to London and I followed a few years later and we hooked up and uh, I got her in in, she wasn't doing much so I got her into my band and she was great most people uh, look back uh, at her as being one of the stars of uh, Britpop because she was a she looked great well um, Martin I I must say I'm looking forward to seeing like the the adventures of Geezer in, in sort of this graphic style and and hoping for your sake that it is it's not embarrassing or it, it shows you in the best light possible but because uh, i completely believe that from from my memory of, of seeing you guys and hearing your stuff um good luck well, with it all uh, for me um for me i, I just want to come off good uh, well i've got my lawyers on the case just just ready uh, in case you know th- th- they do twist it a bit and uh, make me out to be some kind of plonker, but you know certainly from what I've been seeing is make that Philly Philly Bonds making me look good, quite handsome, because I am handsome, yeah, uh, and still handsome. I still got my own hair, uh, though you, I don't like to share any uh, recent pictures of me. But there's still yeah, I think I think it's like I want to remind people of Giza, and I want other bands to realise how tough it is how tough it is to be in a band and that they should give up <laughs> well, well that's great encouragement for all musicians out there <laughs> yeah yeah because it's like and, and a lot of people uh, complain that there's like there's all these like what they call heritage bands from the 90s just going on tour uh, getting on stage playing all these old songs and it, they should make the way for all these new bands but that's completely wrong. It's the opposite. <laughs> where, uh, all these new bands should like just listen uh, to the quality of the music of the 90s and just nod the reds and say, you're right. You're good. We're crap. Get on get on stage, granddad. And uh, we'll, we'll just, you know, clap. Martin, it's been an absolute pleasure. And thanks for coming out of the toilet to speak to me. I know, I know it's, I'm looking forward yeah, to sorry seeing... Sorry about that. It's sorry about that. It's a really uh, bad curry last night. Yeah, it happens to all of us, the best of us. Um, I appreciate you speaking to us. Look forward to seeing you. I'm going back there you. now, actually. I'm going back there now. <laughs> Take care, Martin. Cheers, mate. Cheers. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you again to Will for joining me on this episode. And also a massive thanks to Martin who took time away from his busy schedule to just pop in at the end there and talk about his band, Giza. What a fascinating insight that was. So just to remind you that you can support uh, the Giza Kickstarter, and why wouldn't you, by clicking the links in the description and show notes that are in this episode. Okay, so you can support this podcast uh, if you want to by all the usual ways, and I haven't done this for a long time as well, but this is the rambly bit. Uh, Those of you who've listened before, it's excruciating to listen to, I know. But if you want to follow me on social media, you just have to search for the Indie Alternative Podcast. And I should come somewhere on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Also, as you know, I do all this without advertisers and sponsorship. So if you want to support financially, you can. And in the show notes, again, there will be a link to a coffee donation page where you can just pop on there and donate whatever you think this podcast is worth. That could be a standalone payment, or you can do it monthly. It's up to you. Thank you to everyone who's done that so far. It means a great deal. And lastly, as all podcasters say, to help us get heard and seen by more people on the platforms that you download and listen to this podcast on, if you can rate it and you can review it if you've got the time, it really helps. So that's all the pleading and rambling over with. I'll be back very soon, hopefully with another episode. Um, But if I don't, 
Uh, have a great Christmas and a new year and all the best. Drink responsibly or don't, it's up to you. Take care, see you soon. That was a long outro. Bye.